Okay, here we are for episode two in the retrospectives of Susan Lene. This disembodied voice in the background is me, Paul Lene. It's not a retrospective. Susan wants to differ with what I've already titled it out there in the public realm. What would you call it? Is anybody surprised she wants to argue? <laughs> what would you call it? Retrospect, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. Um, just the life, the memories, the background, something like that. Okay, that's what it is then. We may or may not change the official name, but you have her version of it. And just to prove to the audience that we're paying attention to the view, vast viewer feedback we're getting, note she now has a glass of wine. <laughs> but she also insisted on having a cup of warm water and honey, which I thought was a little over the top. <laughs> but I did it anyway, with the gr gracious assistance of my lovely wife and our GE microwave. So this episode, we're going to, I'm going to try to guide Susan when we all know that that may not be easy. <laughs> I'm going to try to guide Susan through a little bit of a discussion about, let's call it the early years. And I'm going to date this from 1959 which is the date on which I decided that Susan was going to be one of two things in life. Actually, two of two things. Number one was weird, and number two was some sort of a foreign journalist type. So I was terribly prescient, I guess. So in, take, in, both, in both respects. That's right. Take me back to 1959, and I want you to talk about how and why you became a foreign exchange student from... St. Louis Park, Minnesota, who went to France and came back with a phony American accent. Go ahead. It was all due to the newspaper at the time, either the, well, the Minneapolis Star or the Minneapolis <whistles> Tribune. And um, there was an article on the front page of the paper about exchange students yes. going to come to, and they had a bunch of photos of the exchange of exchange students, and they were um, they, they were going to to be coming uh, St. Louis Park or Minneapolis, someplace like that. And my mom was reading the paper one day, and she looked and said, "Carl, don't you think we should have one?" Oh, he said, Carl was your dad. Yes. And he said, have one what? And she said, she said, an exchange student. And I don't remember his exact idea, but he thought that, she thought that would be very interesting to have an exchange student live with us. And we ended up having, well, first, the first one was Inga Nielsen from Odense, Denmark. That was and, in school year 1955-56, Yes. Or 54-55. 54.55. Okay. And then um, she came and went, and that was a wonderful experience. And then some years, a couple years later, we, there was an, an English girl called Wendy Millen from Manchester, England. 59.60 was when she was here. Yeah. And um, both of these, both of these girls at the time had a profound effect on my life um, in very strange ways to describe. This was, those were the years, um, was, it was, the United States was in many ways uh, provincial, but it, they, they certainly, they were not sophisticated, particularly not Inga, whose father worked in the brewery in Carlsberg Brewery in Odense in Denmark. Um, Wendy came from a more uh, university-oriented family, um, and and, and it was an incredible experience just to spend time with them. I thought sometimes she was so insufferable. She, she being? Wendy. Because she went to a, 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 a girls' high school in Manchester, England, called Manchester Girls, which is still famous. And they had to have the same color bobby pins as their hair. Otherwise, they would have to leave school. And I thought... That sounds like the worst place in the world. What kind of education would you want from that? But because her, her family, whom I later, later met, she had one brother, Jimmy, 
and father and mother um, were very interesting people. Very, um, yeah, they were very interesting people. They, and I knew her grandfather, and um, <clears throat> I went to visit them years later and got it walk through the fog when before Manchester had cleaned up its its act. And um, it was thanks to them to went to Wendell, Wendell and Kathleen Mill and Wendy's parents, that our family received a subscription by sea to the Manchester Guardian. I do recall that. It was kind of a printed on a lightweight paper. No, that was much later on. It was heavyweight paper and it came by sea. Okay. Lightweight was much, that was when they were, and it was, it came wrapped up and um, it was an occasion and dad felt he was very kind of puffed up when he had his Manchester Guardian. I don't know if he really enjoyed reading it because the Manchester Guardian <clears throat> was a very, not a conservative paper, but it, but dad being a lifelong Democrat, it was a much, it, that wasn't his politics. He didn't care about the politics. He liked how the paper looked, and he liked the fact that he had it. True. And, and, Drink some tea. And someone had sent him, um, someone had thought to give them a subscription. And the, the arrival of the Manchester Guardian was a, a big deal. And so one of the things that I did, I looked forward to particularly on winter mornings in the family room, after coming back from church, was reading the Manchester Guardian, sitting with the sun coming in in the family room, and reading um, wonderful writers, some of whom I later met, um, Claire Sterling, um, uh, no, I can't remember all the wonderful writers there, so wonderful. Ah, the, the famous person, James now, who had a sex change. He was a great writer. and. Um, well, any of the viewers that can remember James' last name, send your comments in. Because, because he wrote he wrote a lot about Spain. Um, oh God, I can't remember. Anyway, and it was funny if you go back and read his books. It's all these things that he did when he was in Spain. Only his he changed his name. He had a woman's name now as in the title. And I thought this is so hard to believe. He couldn't done, have done any of the stuff as a woman in Spain in 1959. But he was to me. He struck a very so you gravitated towards becoming a, a foreign exchange student going to France based on your I experience with... I didn't gravitate towards it. Our mother thought I should... Oh, okay. So it wasn't your idea. It was, it was there. not my idea at all. Were you against it? No, I, I, had, I didn't want to leave. I was going out with Leroy Leaf yeah. on the Dynamo uh, hockey team. Why would I want to go to France? Okay. And so, you, But you went. Tell us a little bit about your time in France. What city, family, etc. I think the only reason that, that anyone thought I should go to France, because France was a very hard place to find homes for exchange students. They, and there was a family, there still is a family called Deschenes, Henri Deschenes, and their son Francois uh, had taken part in the program um, he had been an, an American field service exchange student. And um, I don't know what this has to do with anything, but anyway. Oh, the Deschen family was kind of pressured into taking a student. It was really hard to By get. By the AFS organization, presumably? Yeah. Okay. It was hard to get. French people did not like to take strangers into that. Was it a good experience? It was fantastic. And how long were you there? Um, probably from August 1959. It seems longer, but I know it was. We arrived in Le Havre in August of 1959, and I returned to Minneapolis to Walt Chamberlain Airport. In, excuse me, in January of uh, 1960. 1960. So, so then you graduated from high school in 1960 and started at the University of Minnesota and completed that course of study for a bachelor's degree in about two and a half years. So pick up now in December of 62. Oh, sorry, I don't get to say anything else except that. <laughs> That's okay. Pick up now in December of 62. You went to New York to do something. No, no, no. Well, tell us what you did. Um, 
Yeah, you got me off track. Well, you want to work for Chubb and Sons? No, no, no. That was later on. Don't, don't, um, so because I had been an exchange student and theoretically knew French, and um, someone who was in my French class in St. Louis Park High School somehow met a, a guy called Charles Aiken, who was looking for a French teacher because he was going to go and he was going to be in the Peace Corps and teach French in Senegal, and he was looking for a French teacher. Had he been selected to be in the Peace Corps, or I was that his hope? No, I don't remember all the details. Okay. But anyway, that was the deal, and he and the the, the I don't know how this girl who had been sitting behind me in my French class knew him, but at some point she said, "Oh, I know someone who speaks really good French, and you should meet her." So he um, came over. I don't know. To my, we got in touch, and my mother said to me, she said, you had the stupidest look on your face when he, when, when he came, and she said, I knew it was bad news. And I, I remember what I was wearing, it was a green mohair, kind of a darkish, mossy green mohair sweater, and she said, I'll never forget that look on your face. <laughs> it was terrible, and she never liked it. Um, I think she didn't have very good reasons not to, but that was... That was the be so. That was the beginning of Charles and me. And um, I'm trying. It, he was still at the, he he was at was at the university. And eventually, we got married on this September seventh, nineteen sixty three. Uh, basically, because so he could get out of the draft. Sure. And we even sought Hubert Humphrey's help. He was very nice. I mean, he, he didn't, couldn't pull, because Charles had grown, well, he'd lived in, um, near St. Louis. His father worked for Bemis Bags, and Fort Leonard Wood was his, that, I remember the name because that was his draft board, and a lot of efforts were made to influence the draft board. And, um, I mean, not illegal, but anyway. And we basically got married because... Um, well, back then, marriage was a deferment. Right, and as a deferment, and um, yeah, so we got married, and so then it, the plan was he was going to go, and um, we were going to go to Europe. When did working for the reporter in New York come in here? Oh, well, that's, that, that was before. That was before you got married? After graduation? No, I remember going to tell Max Askley, who, who by the way, Max Askley was the famous editor of the Reporter magazine. Um, he was, he married Marion Rosenwald, the daughter of Julius Rosenwald, the founder of um, uh, the Reporter magazine. Okay. And um, Max Askley was an Italian Jew. And um, Marion Rosenwald and the Rosenwald family money helps to get him out of out of okay. during the war. But on terms of timeline, did you go there right after graduation in go, go December, ahead. New York, to work at the Reporter in December of 62? Yes, and I'm, I'm telling how, I, how okay. I, I got the job. And so, um, and this has to do with the Palmer House and the Pump Room and Richard Sennett, because Richard Sennett... Um, High school classmate? Yes, famous author. Uh, was good friends with Peter Askley, Max and Marion Askley's son. And um, you, dad and mom were for some reason driving to Chicago at some point, and um, uh, I, I, I would, the annual, the deal was that Peter Askley and Dick Sennett were going to meet Max and Marion for a lunch in Chicago. And for some reason, Dad and Mom drove me to the Palmer House because that's where the lunch was going to be. They provided you transportation to Chicago to be a part of the lunch? Dad and Mom? Yeah. No, maybe they were planning to go to the one. I, I don't know why, but that's, that's, that's how we got there. And so um, it was in the famous pump room where they had these, these flaming, 
um, like shish kebabs. They walked around and these guys had them. And <laughs> one of them almost burned off Marion Askley's hat. It was quite exciting. And then, so, um, I had recently graduated from the university and Senate and I, have, this is, you can edit part of this, this is a good part of the story. I, I graduated from University of Minnesota in December of... 62. 62. Cold, cold, cold. And for some reason, Senate and I decided we were going to go to New York together. Um, and we flew on, I think, what was then called by North, what it was Northwest Airlines, the Milk Run on these DC-6s. And we flew to New York and Senate had some friends and... Were you going there for a graduation trip? Yeah. Just, uh, just to, go, to get to New York. Yeah, just for fun. Yes. Not because you had a job. No, the um, the idea no the idea was to go to New York to get a job, but there was no. But I'll tell you. So I'm getting ahead of myself. It's the pump room is important. Oh, when Mary Askley almost got her hair burned, and then Max asked me. He said to me, "What do you plan to do now?" You, when you're out of university. And I said, I'm going to go to Paris and be an au pair. And he looked at me and said, why would you do that? That's ridiculous, that's crazy. And I felt really bad, because I thought that sounded very exciting. And he said, I can't promise you anything, but when you come to New York, New York come and see me. He was a, and do you know that his papers, all his, his archives are at the University of Minnesota? Why, why there? I, I have no idea. I've never found out. Okay. That would not be hard to find out why they, why they are. And I said, uh, are you serious? And he said, I'm serious. So, so Senate, since Senate knew his son, Peter, and um, Max knew Senate, we got to New York and um, flew to New York. And Senate was staying with the Askeleys, where Sir Isaiah Berlin was also staying. And we went to a New Year's party. And it was very sophisticated. And there's, there are pictures of me at this, this party. And um, so there was a woman called Shirley Katzander, who was the publicity person for the, the um, Reporter magazine. And we knew, I knew the Reporter magazine because my dad read it. He was a big subscriber. That was... That was his, his signature piece. It was a very, um, Max Askley was was Italian Jew, but who was very interested in the Vatican and the opening to the left in Kennedy. He was very in favor of Kennedy. And I don't know how dad got interested in the reporter, but that was a big connection. Was the reporter a magazine about journalism? No. Or about a, journalists? No. Well, it was a magazine about events, about things. Okay, it was, we are the reporter. It's we, called the reporter. Yeah, I okay, understand. You just look it up, and it's there, and it had incredible people like James Morris, who's who's now called Jan Morris, and um, that's the fellow you were talking about yeah, earlier, the and, one who wrote for the Guardian. Yes, and it went to Spain. Yeah, we have the answer to the mystery. And Morris and and Claire Claire Sterling was another writer. Um, Maria Manis, whose family founded the Manis School of Music, was a writer there. She was my great idol. I always wanted to, to emulate her and be such an eloquent writer. Meg Greenfield, who wrote for years for the Washington Post, she was there. Um, well, tell us what your job was there. Max Askley made up a job for me. And what was it? To read the British and French press. For what purpose? For him. So he didn't have to read Oh, and so, so give him summaries? Yes, and give him summaries. Verbally? No, I would write them down. Okay. And so I read The Observer and The Guardian and all these papers every day and, you know, picked up my little idea about press things. And that's how I knew about um, when S Sir Stafford Cripps, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer and Harold Macmillan's government or something, you can look him up. He had a daughter called Peggy Stafford Cripps. Um, who was a highly educated woman, and she married a Ghanaian called Joe Apia. And um, that was a big deal. In, I mean, it was sort of scandalous, but she, they, they were, came from the kind of 
upper class Br British intellectuals, and it was at the time of the 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 springtime of independence in in Africa, and it was a big deal. And I remember that I made a big point of having Max Askley read about the stories of um, Peggy Safford Cripps marrying Joe Appiah. So you were kind of the original news aggregator. Yeah, I was. That's okay. what I, that's what I did. I aggregated stories that Max found he didn't have enough time to read all these papers and so he said, you, you seem interested in stuff, just put together something for me every day. Okay, now in, in, in the interest of time, um, I know you, you got married... You, you mean this is not going on forever? <laughs> uh, I know you got married in September of 63. I know that when you got married in September of 63, you were no longer working for the reporter. You're getting ahead of the game. I know. Trying to move you down the road. Well, I'll move down, but the story was... Charles had gone in the Peace Corps in 1963. Charles Aiken, who I met, I was supposed to help him learn French. And that's what I was doing. I was in New York. I was living in New York. I, I know, I visited you there. I know, okay. And um, I, I went to tell Max that I would have to leave the job because I, I was going to get married. I don't know at what point. And he looked at me and he said, that's a dumb thing to do. He said, why do you want to get married? And I mean, I didn't have a good answer, but anyway, I did. And so, um, <clears throat> uh, I got married and I left the reporter. I didn't work for them again, but that's, that was the beginning of my like, kind of brief, but spectacular um, journalism career, which wasn't really reporting at the time, but I met the journalist who inspired me. Okay, we're going to end this episode now. That's a good point. So, see you later, folks.